I want to talk to you about Pentecost. I'm going to go through this really quick, all right? Everybody say tongues. tongues. All right, you got one, and you got a heavenly one as well. You got to use it. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, being assembled in one place, there as the Lord commanded them, he said, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait, wait. He commanded them, wait. See, he told them, he gave them a commission to go fill the earth with the glory of God, but then he gave them a command. He said, I want you to wait. So the first command wasn't go. The first command was actually wait. So before you go, you got to wait. Say wait. Because you try to go without the Spirit, it's good luck. I mean, it's just not going to happen. But you know, it's because it's not by might or by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one place and one accord. Literally, that word accord just means together. That's all it means. They were together at the same address. And, and literally, it says they were sitting there. And in their tradition back then, if you were praying, it says, when you stand praying, and look it up. It says, Jesus said, when you stand praying, pray, da, da, da. So sitting was just kind of like, hey, what's going on? I wonder, I wonder when he's going to get here. They were there. They were obedient to be where he commanded them to be, but they were there in that one place together. And suddenly, suddenly, what does suddenly mean? He's, wow, I didn't expect that. I mean, wow, you know, sudden. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, a violent wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. It says, then there appeared and divided among and over them tongues as of fire. And one sat on one and each and the other and boom, boom, boom. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Pentecost, very simple. Pentecost means 50. It's five and it's zero. It's a compound word, five and zero, which equals 50. That's what Pentecost is. Acts 2, 39, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all those who are afar off. Afar off is not distance, it's not, but time. So it means in every generation forever there's going to be this gift of the Spirit is in every generation for every single person. So it wasn't like people who are a long ways away in distance, but in time. So that means today the gift of the Holy Spirit is for now. We saw in Acts 8, 9, 10, 19, every time they went and they ministered, they, they, the people were baptized and flooded and filled with the Holy Spirit right there. The same way they were impacted by the Spirit at Pentecost, bam, the Holy Ghost came upon them. They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in tongues. My experience is, I'm giving you this as fast as I can. All right. So Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, and these signs will follow those who believe. Any believers here today? Any believers here today? Can I get a believer in the house? These signs will follow. These are not optional things that could happen, or so maybe. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They'll lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So uh, let's go all the way down to Mark 16, the new tongues. We got that. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 6 to 13. But what I do have, I give you. I love this. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are we stuck? We get stuck. Anyways, Acts chapter 3. Just go to Acts chapter 3, 6 to 13. But what I do have, I give you. And this is Peter on the day of Pentecost. Not the day, sorry, not the day of Pentecost, but a few days later. He's going to the temple, and he sees a, a guy who's lame from birth, all right? And he says, what I do have, I give you. Say, I do have something. And I, uh, I have possession with the intent to distribute. <laughs> I am carrying something. I am packing. I am loaded. I am infected with the kingdom of God. I am infectious. I got a virus from heaven and it's going viral and it's filling the earth. Everywhere I go, <coughs> I'm loosening the glory. Here he was, said, I got something and I'm ready to give it to you. So Peter was packing something. He was a carrier of something. You're a carrier of something. Everywhere you go, you can loose. Everywhere you go, the kingdom of God is and you're a dispenser of heavenly favor. Can I get an Amen. All right, good. Acts chapter 4, 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled. The word untrained is the word in the Greek, idiotus. It says, we recognize these guys are idiotus. It's where we get the word idiot. All right? It's where they get the word ignoramus. So we know these guys. They're idiots. These guys are ignoramuses. Isn't it amazing that Jesus chose to work with people like that? Isn't it? That's why I always say, why did he choose me? I'm so awesome. <laughs> you know what? When you understand that I'm nothing, he can be everything. You know what? And with him, you can be everything. And all things are possible to them that believe. Amen? Without him, you are 
nothing. But here's what they marvel. They marvel because we know these guys. These guys, these guys are just, just they're, they're idiots. But uh, we know that they're untrained men. But he, they said they saw something different. And it says they knew that they had been with Jesus. Now, they had been with Jesus before, but they, they recognized there was a tangible sense of the presence of Christ on them right now. So there was something there. All right. And there's three major feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Very, very important. Passover was, they were delivered from Egypt, and Pentecost was when the law was given, and Tabernacles is when they were celebrate harvest. Now, Passover was fulfilled at the cross, and one day, Passover was fulfilled. Pentecost was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit fell in the book of Acts. When it says the fullness of time came, bam, one day, Tabernacles is going to be fulfilled in... I don't know, but what do you think? I mean, one day it was fulfilled, one day it was fulfilled, harvest. Do you think that in a day a nation could be saved? Do you think that in a day the glory of God could just go bam and, and just, just sweeping harvest? I don't know, but I'm just saying, if there's a pattern, it was one day, one day. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. So the very day that the Jews around the world gathered in Jerusalem to reaffirm their commitment to the law of Moses, that day, that day that they came to reaffirm the Ten Commandments, on that day, the day of Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit fell. So you see, the Holy Spirit fell. So that very day that they celebrated the law of Moses, the Holy Spirit descends on them, offering the gospel of the kingdom, the promise of a new life to all who believe in Jesus. The law was skin deep, but the gospel of grace goes right to the core. There was a whole new way of living introduced to Pentecost. The old covenant was the law. That's what they were celebrating. But Jesus said, I got a new covenant. I got a new way of living. I'm going to take my law. I'm going to write it on their hearts. I'm going to put it in their minds. It's not going to have an external thing, but through internal power and presence, these people are going to live a new life. That's what Pentecost is all about. It's where those things that were opposed to you and, and seem to condemn you, suddenly the power of God is in you to be everything he called you to be. So it's a whole different way of living. All right? The contrast of the two, two covenants. You ready? Here's the contrast of first Pentecost. It was 50 days after they got out of Egypt. Flames on the mountain. They were shaking. The law and tablets was given how to live. There was a drunken party that took place and 3,000 people died. That was the first Pentecost. The Pentecost in the book of Acts, this Pentecost, it was 50 days after uh, the cross. It was flames and it was a violent wind. It was the spirit came and the law was put on our hearts. So now there was an internal power to live, not rules on how you should live, but the power to live was given. A drunken party took place. These are not drunk as you suppose. They are just whacked in the Holy Ghost. Why did they think they were drunk? They looked drunk. 3,000 people, 3,000 people died when the law was given. 3,000 people came into the kingdom the day the Holy Ghost fell. How many think it's better? How many think it's good or good or say good or good or all right? So that's a really good contrast. Thank you, Pastor. All right. So uh, David Wilkerson said, when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, he takes over all the preaching, counseling, and Bible reading you can absorb will be dead to you unless you have the Holy Ghost living in you. He makes you understand and know it is God speaking to you. Amen. Amen. Now, tongues are really, really important. Say, tongues are important. Tongues are not optional. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. I had all about the history of tongues and when it was restored in January 1st, 1909, when Agnes Osman, she uh, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, first one there, and then we had a Susan, we had the Welsh Revival and all these things. I'm going to skip a lot of the history, just going to move on. Is that all right? But it's all there. You know, you can get these notes online. You can read the whole thing and go through it all. And it's really, really good. It's interesting that Azusa was the day, the day uh, after uh, that the, uh, there was a shaking uh, took place. The day after there was a shaking, uh, it was actually the day before the earthquake in San Francisco. The day before that was when the Holy Spirit fell at Azusa Street in L.A. There was an earthquake of the spirit took place, and then there was an earthquake in the natural. But uh, anyways, just uh, some of that. Now let's go to this slide where it says, praying in tongues is not optional. You ready? You want to read these few things right here? Praying in tongues, go ahead. Just go ahead. There it is. Praying in tongues is not an optional practice for believers. Amen. Praying in tongues is not optional. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I could take it or leave it. No, don't leave it. All right, it's not optional. Praying in tongues causes you to engage the rhythms of heaven. Praying in tongues keeps you under an open heaven, and praying in tongues causes you to develop a spiritual acuteness. Oh, Jesus. 
Wow, okay, that's good. Uh, Charles Karen, he said, tongues is the only spiritual gift deliberately designed to attack a man's ego and pride. It exposes insincerity, self-centeredness, falsity, and other negative traits in believer. Because it is a unique attack on the human intellect, tongues remains the eternal watch guard at the gate. In a very calculated way, this gift protects the others from exploitation. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to choose one charisma and reject another. I just like that. I just like it. And you know what? Really, remember the first time you spoke in tongues and you felt it was moving, it was emotional, it was all that stuff, but then, you know, you, a couple hours later, you're having a coffee going, what was that? Like, that was crazy stuff. And then the devil comes and says, that's nonsense. That was just you. That was just babble. They shook you, you know. Speak, hold on, let go, take it, receive it, let it go, hang on. Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, he got a bow tie, she got a bow tie. Came on a Honda. She left in a Kawasaki. <laughs> so you're just trying to figure it out. Then you walk away and go, that was crazy. That was... But you know what? This is literally, and I love what Charles Karen says. Charles Karen believes that the gift of tongues is to offend your mind to get your spirit. And it's the watch guard. It is the watch gate of all the precious things of the spirit. If you're too proud to shoot, you'll limit all the other things being manifest in your life. I think, I think that's probably true. Well, let me, let me share some more things with you very quickly. Researchers in the University of Pennsylvania, they studied people speaking in tongues. Interesting thing, when you speak in tongues, you're, you're, uh, you're the, part, the, the verbal part of your brain's not even active. You're speaking, but the verbal part of your brain's not active. And what is active is all the way back in your subconscious. See, usually it's your conscious mind has to go and, and rule and, and establish things in your subconscious. But when you speak in tongues, you're automatically going back into your subconscious. When you... 99% of what you do comes out of your subconscious realm, not your conscious realm. What you're doing consciously is reinforced back here by beliefs and events and histories and memories. But to get in there, you've generally got to repeat things, go through things. But when you pray in tongues, it bypasses the conscious realm, goes right into your subconscious and write stuff on your head. And it's scientifically been proven that that part of your brain is active when you speak in tongues. And it's mind-boggling to them because you're speaking, but your verbal part of your brain isn't even active. And it says, when I pray in tongues, it says, my understanding is not active. I'm praying in the spirit. Interesting stuff. Scientifically proven that God's pretty awesome. All right. Anyways, look, let's move on. Uh, people dropped the Holy Spirit. They did it because 365, three, year 367, they decided to make the Bible. All right. So they took all kinds of letters written by the apostles. They gathered all the letters up and they decided which ones did they think were actually inspired. So this can wreck your world if you think about it, because how did the Bible come into being? Well, it fell out of the heavens and somebody caught it and God said, this is my word. Hang on to it. That's not how it happened. It was just guys like you and me who were inspired by the Holy Ghost to wrote stuff down. And then we got their letters and we looked at them and said, you know what? These aren't just letters to Fred, Bob, or Sue. These are letters from God to the body of Christ. And so they sat in a room and decided how to figure out what was, what was of the Spirit and what wasn't. So they threw some books out and they kept some. And then, that was 367, then some of them decided that now that we have the holy book, now that we have the instruction manual, all extra spiritual activity is now no longer necessary. That's where they get the whole word cessation. And cessation came, they hung their hat on this verse in Corinthians where it says, now that the perfect has come, we can put off what is not perfect. And I don't know how they got that, but anyways, that's what they did. And they decided that now chapter 12 and chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians are unnecessary. Chapter 13 is in, chapter 11 is in, chapter 15 is in, but we're going to get rid of those two because we got the Holy Bible. So they literally, all kinds of churches in town, do you know why they don't speak in tongues? Because they believe in cessation. They believe that that gives now is no longer necessary because now that we have the Bible, we don't need the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? It's nonsense. So there's no power. The Spirit saves you. The Spirit inspires you. The Spirit quickens the Scripture to us. But the Spirit doesn't do anything weird in church. And that tongue stuff, not anymore. In fact, if you hear a tongue anymore, it's the devil. There's all kinds of churches in town believe that. Sadly, that's terrible. But they hang their hat on this one doctrine that we got Father, Son, and Holy Book. And that's it. And it's really sad, and we still love them. Amen. They're doing a lot of other things better than us. But we speak in tongues. Okay, so I got three minutes. Can you hang with me? What's interesting to me is that uh, when you think about, we experience life through our senses, physically through our senses, all right? So 
I would think if we were created in the image of God and our body is really, really awesome, I would think that if we're the most amazing expression of, of you know, some kind of flesh or something in the earth, shouldn't we smell better than a dog? I don't mean, I don't mean smell better, your dog smells. I don't mean that. But I mean, when I'm opening an orange, Beauregard could be anywhere in the house. And there's times I try to do it carefully and quietly. But it doesn't matter where I am in the house, if I just go rip, just a rip of the orange, all of a sudden, and he just trot, he loves oranges. I don't know what it is. There's some days I just want, I want to eat this orange just myself. I don't want to share with you. Mom says that you're getting too fat and this is a lot of sugar in oranges and you need to stay away from them. But he comes and says, you're fat too, let's share. So... <laughs> But he's got a ridiculous sense of smell. Do you know dogs, it's over 100 times more acute, their sense of smell. You know, some dogs even more than that. You know what I mean? So when I say smell, I don't mean body odor or dog odor. I mean smell, the sense of sense of smell. You would think if we're better than dogs, we would have a better sense of smell. Now, a falcon, a falcon literally, if I had the eyesight of a falcon, a, a plane flying at 40,000 feet up in the air, I could look at that plane and I could read what's on the flapping wing. And that's how incredible their eyesight is. You'd think if I'm the most awesome representation of God in the earth, I should have incredible eyesight. But I don't, there's lots, I mean, there are some animals that they know an earthquake's going to happen before it happens. You'd think we would be that smart. There's some bugs that know when it's going to rain. You can have a little bug and put him in a box, and if he goes to the other side of the box, you know a storm's coming. And you can't see it anywhere, but he knows. You would think I should know that stuff. So I wonder why... Do I lack in the sensual realm when there's other aspects of God's creation? He gave them way better ability than me. I really believe he did that because the one ability that we have that nobody else has is we can walk in the spirit of God. God is spirit and we are spirit and he wants us to hook up with him. And I believe that God wants that one sense to be more acute than any other sense in our life and that is our sense of the spirit of God and our sense of being connected with him. Okay, did you get that? Can I have two more minutes? All right, let's go all the way to... Let's go all the way to 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I pray with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that is within me, and I also pray intelligently with my mind. So we pray and we communicate with God, but when we pray and communicate with God, we expect to receive. So prayer is not for God's benefit. It's not like, God. I wish you guys would pray. It's not for his benefit, it's for ours. So God, God wants us to pray and engage him. First, but you pray in the spirit and with your understanding. You pray with the spirit in me, and I also pray at times intelligently, which means when you're praying in the spirit, this part of your head's not even involved. Your conscious realm isn't even involved, but your subconscious and being connected to the spirit is what it's really all about. For he who speaks in a tongue, chapter 14, verse 2, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, say in the spirit, when you're praying in tongues, how many want to get in the spirit? The Bible says when you're praying in tongues, you are in the spirit. In the spirit, when you're praying in tongues, in the spirit, you are speaking mysteries, say mysteries. Mysteries is a very real word. It doesn't mean mysteriously. It merely means something. You're speaking mysteries. Look at the word mysteries. The word mystery is mysterion, which means a hidden thing, a secret thing, or a mystery. Generally, mysteries, religious secrets, confided only to the initiated or not ordinary mortals. A hidden or secret thing, not obviously understanding. A hidden purpose or a counsel. Vine's Expository Dictionary says mysteries, that which is being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension, can be made known only through divine revelation, and it is made known to those who are illuminated by the Spirit. Literally, Paul Paul, though, said, when you pray in the Spirit, you're in the Spirit, you're speaking mysteries. You are speaking the divine counsel of God. When you're praying in the Spirit, you are engaging heaven. You are coming into a place where, have you ever been praying in tongues? And it, although you don't really understand what you're praying, then suddenly your spiritual understanding catches up and you start to get revelation as you're praying in tongues and something is quickened to you and you're starting to have an exchange with God and you're feeling like God is writing on the mainframe of your head the revelation of heaven? Tongues is not an optional deal. It's not something that God threw in just to freak everybody out. Tongues is a very, very important gift to the body of Christ. All right, I'm almost done. Say thank you, Pastor. Second Peter 3, 15 and 16 is Paul. Is here, Peter said, Peter said, man, our beloved brother Paul, according to wisdom given to him, has written to you and also to all the, all the epistles. But speaking in a truth, these things, wow, they're hard to understand. <laughs> Like Peter's like, I knew Jesus. I hung out with Jesus. I spent a lot of time with Jesus. Paul never had a physical relationship with Jesus. And yet Paul, somehow, he's walking in wisdom and revelation way beyond us. And honestly, some of the stuff he's speaking, it's hard to understand. 
That's what he's saying. He says, in the physical realm, I don't know what's going on. What do you think that's all about? Do you ever just say, what is that about? No? Okay, I'll tell you. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank God, Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. I speak in tongues more than any of you. What does Paul do in his spare time? What is he doing? He's engaging the heavenly realm. He's entering into the rhythms of heaven. He's stepping into divine mysteries of God. Paul said, I do it more than anybody. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, servants of Christ and stewards of the same word, the mysteries of God. Paul is saying, when I pray in tongues, I'm engaging heaven. When I'm praying in tongues, I'm hooking up with divine revelation. When I'm praying in tongues, I am stewarding the mysteries of God. Because when you're in the spirit praying in tongues, you are speaking the mysteries of God. Hello. Hello. Am I going too fast for you? Okay. Good. I'm almost there. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 16. I'm not reading the whole thing, just a part of it. But we speak a wisdom of God in a mystery, a hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that I think the big connection between the spirit realm and Paul was that he spoke in tongues more than anybody. And Paul said, I wish you would all speak in tongues because I wish you would all attach yourself to the rhythms of heaven and walk in the spirit and operate out of the mysteries of God. There are mysteries for today that will only come into revelation and manifestation in a body of people who engage the spiritual realm with the gift of tongues. Today, Pentecostal churches are abandoning tongues. Let's not do that. Let's not get weird. Let's just try to get people saved and build big churches. It's garbage. I'm not against Pentecostal churches. We are one. But I tell you, it's like we are discarding the very thing that advantages us, that engages us with heaven, that brings the very mysteries of God into expression and manifestation. The one thing the Apostle Paul said, I wish you would all do it. And he says, here's something that I do more than anybody. I pray in tongues. Who was the guy who had third heaven revelation and walked in an abundance of that and wrote half the New Testament, brought the revelation we have today? It was Paul. And Paul is trying to cry out, these mysteries come through embracing the gift of tongues and practicing it more and more and more. You'll step into a new realm you'll operate out of the rhythms of heaven you'll demonstrate the power of god in your life because you embrace this ministry of the spirit so this is not a denomination it's not an organization (laughs) i'm preaching too fast for myself this is urgent this isn't optional I mean, if this is how the first outpouring of the Spirit came, it's going to be a big deal in this outpouring right now that we're walking in. The gift of tongues is essential for every one of us to walk in, to operate in. It says when you pray in tongues, you build yourself up. When you pray in tongues, you talk to God. When you pray in tongues, you get revelation from God. Praying in tongues is a big deal deal. Hebrews 8 verse 10 and 11 says, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. This is about being whacked in the Holy Ghost. Whacked in the Holy Ghost? This is what it is. You see, pastor, aren't you afraid if you say they don't need anyone to teach you, then we don't need you anymore? Well, of course you need me because I'm an equipping gift and you're always going to need to be equipped. But you know what? My equipping is not to make you dependent on me. I, my teaching is not, come to our church, I'm awesome, I will teach you wonderful stuff. You know, come to our church, I'm nobody, I will hook you up with Jesus. <laughs> come to our church, he's brilliant, and I want to get you fully equipped in the spirit of God. Come to our church, and I just want to give you revelation that, you know what, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. If you depend on me, your eyes are in the wrong place. But I want to hook you up to Jesus. My equipping is very simple. I got a friend. He's a Holy Ghost. And I tell you, you know what? When I'm not around and you can't call me, what should I do now? You know, the more wise one is with you all the time. Pastor, aren't you afraid you'll lose your job? No, are you kidding? There's so many more people that need to get hooked up with the Holy Ghost because so many people are in the bondage of a Christianity that is control and a yoke of terrorism of pastors over top of people's lives. Set me free. Why don't you, babe? Any equipping that makes you dependent on a person is not equipping, it's control. And I have no problem hooking people up with Jesus because sometimes I'm golfing. 
And while I'm golfing, I'm shoot da ba san da ba 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 boom ba di di Anyways, you have to be careful. With that. So. Hallelujah! Come on, stand up with me. It's the day of Pentecost. I want our people who are praying and ministering today. Can you come up to the altar now? Come on up front, people around the ministry team. Come on up right now. You know, if you're here today and you've never spoken in tongues, let me say something. You can. You can pray in tongues. You can speak in tongues. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can experience that right now here today. If you've never spoken in tongues before, today is your day. And we want to pray for you. How many have enjoyed the fire of God today? Isn't he awesome? It's been a wonderful experience. His presence today and his power. And you know, I love what God spoke to us today. That You know what? Visitations are over. Habitations are fully in. You know, you're not, you're not leaving the presence of God. You've been impacted by his presence. You've been freshly equipped today. Something you didn't have before you came is now on you. Your life has changed and you're never going to be the same. Just turn to your neighbor and say, that's true. All right, go and pray for you right now. You know, if you've not, please, if you've never, you know, experienced the baptism of the Spirit, or you've never spoken in tongues, I want you to come today and these people are going to minister to you and you're going to speak in tongues today, all right? And this is not optional. This isn't like, you know, you get a Ford and do you want the rain wipers? <laughs> it's not an option. This is mandatory equipment in the life of a believer, all right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. I thank you for Holy Spirit. I thank you, Spirit of God, that you are here. I thank you for your power, your majesty, and your might. It's incredible, your wisdom, the way you've made this plan, and I'm good with it. I really am. So, Father, I pray as we've done so much today as your body and, and, and experienced Jesus, your miracle gifting, and just all that you do, we're so grateful. But, Father, I pray the revelation of tongues, the revelation of the Spirit of God, this Pentecost, no one would walk away. It's, it's like the old commercial, don't leave home without it. Don't, don't take a step in your world. Jesus said, wait until you're endued with power from on high. So Father, I pray there'd be a fresh baptism on all of us. But Father, I pray that all those who've never experienced you, Holy Spirit, I pray right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize you now in the Holy Ghost and fire. I command the Spirit of God to get on you. I command the manifestation of tongues to come on you. The revelation of its necessity in your life to be clear. I command it to come forth in power and in authority in Jesus' precious name. Amen.